Greater Firefox is listed as vulnerable. That, uh, that listing took place in, or became enacted uh, back in 2001, more than 20 years ago. And it was on the basis of population surveys that were done back in the late 80s um, and the late 90s, which showed at least 30% reductions. In our state, we have three species. Um, of course, the vulnerable greater Firefox, um, uh, as well as the blacks and the little reds. Uh, but quite interesting when you look at the distribution of Greyhound and Firefox, it really does almost represent where people like to live as well, where the most of Australians live. Um, and therein lies a bit of a problem with Firefoxes are um, in large roofs next to people's houses. Firefoxes are probably the most observable bats in Australia. So obviously when Firefoxes are, are roosting, it looks like there's lots of them. And that's where we hear a lot of people say, well, how can the Greyhound Firefox be vulnerable or threatened when I can see so many of them. The thing to keep in mind is that just because there's lots of flying foxes in one camp, it doesn't mean that the species isn't threatened because what you see in camp is really the, the population of the species congregated. It's, it's a congregation of all the flying foxes that are occurring in the local area. And so we now know that flying foxes that don't occur in discrete populations, um, pretty much the whole, of, of the whole of the country is one um, interbreeding population. And they're very nomadic. So reproduction is it's quite it's quite an interesting thing because often when white fox camps the numbers of animals in, in the camp increase, people say oh, they're, they're breeding like rabbits and they're breeding like rodents. And I'm hoping that this slide will be able to dispel that myth. What, what we've got there is the, the timeline throughout the year of creating the fly fox, uh, also applicable to the black fly fox. And they're very seasonal in, in the way that they breed. Um, and you can really you can turn up to a camp and kind of look at the, the month of the year and look at this chart and work out what they're doing. So as you can see around late January to April, the males are establishing mating territories inside the camp and the females they get pregnant around April and May. The young are born in October and, and November and then being cared for by, by the mother between you know, between that time until about February. What's really interesting is that when the when the latest pups are still being raised by their parents, actually mating um, takes place again. And so what you can see there is that pretty much reproductive females are almost, they, they, they pretty much spend the whole year constantly in a cycle of some stage of reproduction. And the number of fly foxes that are born from one, um, one female each year, not surprising, is actually just one. They don't breed like rabbits. Every female gives birth to one young um, at, the end, at the end of the year. Sometimes there's twins, and if you ever see a fly fox with twins, you want to get a photo because you may not see that. Um, so, you know, what you can see that chart is the female fly fox goes through a lot of effort, a whole year's worth of effort, just to bring one pup into the world. So finally, let's talk about diet and mood. Fly foxes are vegetarian. Um, they actually eat less meat than us, which is none. On the screen there, you can see some of their food, that, you know, the flowers there, they get the pop and they get the nectar out of it. Um, and as they're doing that, they get pollen smeared all over their face and the rest of their body, and, and that's how the plant actually um, pollinates, actually uses the fly fox to do that. And they also do eat um, uh, native fruits as well. Each of these species that they feed on doesn't produce food year round. And so then what you see is these massive shifts in food availability uh, throughout, the, throughout their range. And so as a result, fly foxes need to be on the move. They need to be nomadic. It's just this cost of movement throughout their range. When I mean, you look at a fly fox in camp, you really got to think about this. This animal probably does more mileage than, than we would in their whole life. They're just constantly on the move. Camp was first established in around 2009. Um, it's predominantly occupied by grain and fly fox. And the population varies seasonally over time. But once upon a time, it was privately owned. Um, and in the early 1900s, the site was pretty well cleared of all the vegetation on site. There was a fair bit of uh, disturbance in the middle of the site. So it was an orchard at one stage, it then became a chicken farm. Uh, it had a range of different dwellings on the, on the property. So quite a lot of disturbance on the site. From 2017 to 2021, Council undertook a rehabilitation project, rehabilitation project on the site. Um, it was really looking to increase the overall supply of diversity in the site, but also to try and help some of that back in the conflict. So that particular project restored about 34% of the core area. This little 
the log in here was um, the restoration project area. It was predominantly bamboo. We had some significant weed control, um, planted about 20,480 plants, and they were specifically selected for Firefox roosters and foraging habitat. It's been a really great success. They're about three and a half to four years old, those planters now. They're around about five or six metres high. We've got really good um, structure in all the canopy layers, the um, vegetative layers. There's about 59 different species that were planted in there, really diverse, and we're really happy to say that in March 2022, we started noticing bats utilising that site. Um, so we've got a, a new eighth year grant project to the site to restore the remaining core area of the site. That's about 0.7 hectares, and it's really fully at those same payments, trying to increase biodiversity on the site restore roosting and foraging habitat and help to reduce that potential in that conflict. Three aims, restore habitat, reduce, uh, raise community awareness and uh, monitoring. This is the project site itself, so there, you can see where that 103 is, it's kind of a funny circle, that was the revegetation work from four years ago, three and a half. And the area in the red polygon is the current project site, so that's what we're working on. That focusing on for the, the next eight years. Zone A is pretty well 100% need, um, really dense, pretty little Antarctica, um, pretty nasty weeds, very little health vegetation, and no resilience, so we could do some weed with hope and then it should come back and be planted out. So the approach there is full weed removal and free vegetation. So in the zone A area, we're looking at putting in about 23,100 plants. The zone B area is where the swamp like floodplain forest is. Um, it's got a fair few weeds in, particularly some nasty vines, morning glory and things like that. So the focus in zone B is targeting the tree and getting there, doing some assisted regeneration works to get the leaves and help that BEC recover itself. So this is the area prior to any work starting. 22. And that is the area as it sits currently. So a significant amount of um, weedy vegetation removal. And it's in a bit of a holding pattern at the moment. So we're doing some spraying work to control the weeds that are coming back. Um, but we can't do too much in terms of significant works because we don't want to disturb the bats at the moment. Until the pups are at a point where they, uh, they can handle disturbance that moved on and handle population of the sites um, back to low numbers, which is usually around May. So in, it's one, one good thing to know is the population at the moment is around about five and a half, six thousand, so pretty good numbers. So it's nice to know that the restoration efforts in terms of clearing that weed have an impact to that on the site. The next step is we've got a whole lot of mulch on the other side of the creek, about 600 cubic metres of mulch that's going to be brought over and into the site uh, in probably May, June, depending on how the bats go, or whether they're there or not. And then we're getting them planted out, and hopefully in three or four years' time, we'll have that whole core area restored. We're also trying to drive some community awareness with the project. Uh, we've gone out to the Living Smart Festival with this cool trailer and a whole lot of posters, and we're trying to get people involved in what we're doing and raise awareness about the importance of bats, that they're a keystone species. It's critical to manage them. There's also the Eco Advocate and What's On publications that go out, and we've been putting some articles in there, giving updates about where the project's at, so if people are interested, they can follow up through that. There's a project website on Council's uh, webpage. If you just go to Blind Fox Blind Fox Camp, it'll give you an update on where the project's at. So we're trying to survey residents. Local residents that are affected residents that are adjacent to the camp, and then just the broader community to find out what their attitudes are towards bats. Over the eight year term of the project, what we're trying to do is improve people's understanding of awareness of bats and change some of their opinions so they support More feedback we can get better, and we'll be doing that throughout the eight year program. Monitoring's been a really important part of it as well, it's been monitored as part of the 
the CSIRO National Flying Fox Census, I think it's since 2013 that's been occurring on site, and monthly since 2017. So we've got some really good data. We're really looking at how our works affect changes in population and characteristics on site over time, and understanding what is the best management practices on site to ensure long term. There's a project manager who's looking after most of the works on the ground. She's amazing. Her name's Brooke the Forest. If you've got any questions, you know, feel free to contact council, contact myself or Brooke, and jump on the council's project page and you can follow what's going on throughout the day project. So I want to talk about this monitoring and Flying Fox management more generally. Um, and it just basically tries to show how diverse uh, Flying Fox management can be. If we're saying they're nomadic and they move around and they be unpredictable about when they're going to be in the camp. How do you manage them? The answer to that is a great degree of difficulty. Um, and it, it, it's also difficult because the themes in fly fox management are quite diverse. There's the roost in urban areas. We're seeing an increasing pattern of fly fox roost uh, being in urban areas, and that causes the, the, the angst that we see up and down the coast. There's also climatic events that have seemed to have become more of an issue since 2006. Um, most of those climatic events that affect fly foxes are extreme heat events or heat waves. Um, we haven't had them for a few years now because we've had quite wet weather over the summer. They have been increasing since 2006 and the latest one was back in 2019 20, um, which saw something like a minimum estimate of about 72,000 fly foxes um, in over 40 um, years in Australia that, that perished in those, um, in those heat stress events. The third issue there of fly foxes taking cultivated fruit, and that's, a, that's something that's been happening since early settlement. The early settlers started planting fruits, fly foxes are growing there, wanting to take advantage of that. Um, habitat loss is, of course, an issue for a lot of species. What it means for fly foxes, it means their food availability um, is reduced, and it's an animal that already has to travel so much mileage in order to get food, so you can imagine. Uh, food becoming, or food resources becoming fragments and doesn't help that situation. Uh, and we do see what they call food shortage events or starvation events. And what they are is where an entire region just doesn't have food for, for a period of time. And fly foxes actually get trapped in that where they are, they can't find any food. And because they can't find any food, they then don't have the energy to go and fly several kilometers away to find a place where there is food. And so in situations like that, um, there are fly foxes that are uh, just dropping dead all over town. Um, there's also this species ecology, that's an important part of uh, management. It's just trying to understand the species more. Um, doing the research is important to uh, fill knowledge gaps. And you know, some of the vital knowledge gaps that we've been able to fill um, by, by recent is trying to understand the nomadic movements of fly foxes. And um, uh, that's been very useful to understand from a management perspective because in times gone past, we've, um, we've thought that fly foxes were occurring in discrete populations. Mm -hmm. We now know that we have to manage them as a nationwide population. Um, finally, health and welfare, that's talking about some of the diseases associated with fly foxes, and I'll go into that in detail later on in this uh, presentation. That's what the, the spectrum of fly fox management looks like. But if we were to group all those areas of management into broader categories, there's the interactions between fly foxes and people, and then there's mitigating threats to fly foxes and research more generally. But very importantly to, to think about is that ultimately to address all of these components of fly fox management, there's something that underpins it, which is fly fox monitoring. Because we need to know where fly foxes are in the first place, and we need to know where the largest numbers of fly foxes are at any one time. This is a collaborative uh, program. It started uh, in 2013. It's a nationwide project, so it's managed by the Australian, uh, the Australian government led by the CSIRO that do the science behind it, and there's state government uh, partners as well. So our department, my team specifically, uh, we coordinate the volunteers in New South Wales, and it's a big job because there's about 300 fly fox camps uh, that we, we're trying to find volunteers for. The way the program works is in quarterly census, so as we said before, fly fox is nomadic. They're constantly redistributing themselves across the landscape. So what that means is it's not as simple as any other form of survey that you would just survey one area and then move on to the next. You've actually got to survey them all at the same time. And that, that can be quite logistically difficult. So four times a year we have people all over up and down the coast from 
from Queensland all the way to Adelaide, um, going out there within the same three days uh, to try to catch fly foxes in as many camps as they can. That takes place in the month of February, May, August and November, and Syro have decided on those months because that coincides with different parts of their reproductive cycle that they're interested in. Um, and they basically work on the third Thursday to Saturday period um, of every uh, of those months. And the idea is that hopefully we've got enough coverage um, of, of where fly foxes are. And we said that there are lots of gaps in the number of camps that are being counted. So if you're ever interested in counting fly foxes, get in touch with them. So this map, I've taken that off the Australian government website. That shows all the fly fox camps in Australia. We've already had fly foxes that you saw in my first presentation. They kind of fell from that little Queensland. Um, all the way to um, Adelaide, and, and pretty much all of the camps you see from the middle of Queensland to Adelaide are occupied by grey-headed fly foxes. Mm -hmm. Under this program, there's more than 650 known roof sites, and that's, that's increasing with um, different technologies like a um, like weather radar. They can actually pick up on the weather radar and a lot of fly foxes coming from the roof, so that's, that's really interesting technology. That we're able to then, then look at a, 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 a map and pick out where there's likely to be fly foxes flying out. Um, because no other animal really in Australia does that. And so we're probably going to get that map, you know, if you look at it in five years' time, it's probably going to be a lot more detailed. Um, as I said before, 414 um, camps are located in New South Wales. They're not all active, some of these are historical camps, um, but we just never know when fly foxes are going to go back to, that, back to those locations, and so it's quite important to be checking in. Let's zoom down to the Hunter Central Coast area. In this area, we have in this region, we have 83 locations um, where the fly foxes have been uh, recorded, and then they are on, on the map, and you might be able to see you know, where you live and where the, where the camps are. So let, let me just finish up by uh, uh, just talking a little bit about living with fly foxes. Uh, firstly, I've talked to you before about um, the diseases that fly foxes do, do carry, and it's very important to address some of the myths that are to do with that. Let's firstly start with a disease called strain bat and so on. So that, that makes the, the headlines every now and then. Um, it's, just, it's a virus that's similar to rabies. It's not rabies itself, but it's, it's similar. Um, it's a virus that you don't want to get. But on the other hand, we know that the only way you can get this virus is by getting bitten by a fly fox. You really can't get bitten by a fly fox unless you're actually going out there picking them up. They don't attack you, they don't chase you. Last week I was in, inside a fly fox camp directly underneath. Um, and sometimes they get spooked and the way they fly is they drop out of the trees and then fly off. That sometimes creates the illusion that you've been chased by a fly fox, but, but they're not after you, they have no reason to come after you. So anyway, I say all that to say that the only way you can really get bitten by a fly fox is if you actually pick them up. So, so the, the bottom line is just, just don't touch them. Um, if you don't touch them, you're not going to get bitten. And if you do find one that needs rescuing, uh, you, you would contact your, you know, your, um, your local wildlife rescue organisation, which in this area is hard to wildlife rescue. They do an amazing job. These guys know what they're, they're, they're doing, they know what they're talking about. Um, and if you find a ninja fly fox, then the people who want to be called, don't touch the fly fox yourself. Um, that's the easiest way to avoid a strain of atlas virus. I should also mention that strain of atlas virus, it's not a disease that's found in a lot of fly foxes. We say that they occur in less than 1% of, of the whole population. The reason why we say less than 1% is because we actually don't know how, how much of the population uh, has the virus, but we know that it's a very, very, very small amount. There's another disease called hendrovirus, which uh, also is uh, not all about. Um, so it is, it is found in, in um, <coughs> fly foxes, but it's very important to note that there's no evidence at the moment that you can get that disease from the fly fox directly. How it works is the fly fox, um, or the, the horse gets the disease from the fly foxes, and then um, people interacting with the sick horse can get it from the horse. Um, so the take home message there is if you do have a horse and it's sick, Take precautions. Well, the other way that prevents that from happening is you just don't water and then feed the horses directly under a tree to find this disease. That's the easiest way to get that disease. And so I've said all of that to say that yes, there are life threatening diseases from, from fly foxes, but there's also very simple ways that you can avoid um, getting uh, the diseases themselves just by following their simple protocol. So let's, let's also understand that behavior a little bit more. You know, people think about fly foxes, they also 
noise. So let's just kind of decode that a little bit. Yes, white foxes can be noisy, particularly um, when they're leaving and returning to the camp. Um, and, and often people get upset about it. But if we think about it from a family context, what's going on there? The, the mothers are coming back to the camp and they, they communicate with their pups um, through calling. So you can imagine it's like a, it's a, it's like a, a school pickup. Um, you know, a lot of parents, lots of kids, have a habit of the two find each other. And so that's how the bats find each other. The mother and, and the young find each other by, by calling to each other. And it's, it's amazing when you think that there's that much noise, but the mother bat's actually able to locate its young uh, that it's worked so hard for over the course of a whole year being pregnant. Um, it's able to find that, that one juvenile that belongs to them in amongst all those other juveniles. Um, so that's, that's, that's pretty amazing. So if you ever get woken up before, in the morning with five weeks and come back, just think about it as, as a school kicker. Um, people often want to disturb fly foxes and scare them away. Um, during the day, fly foxes will settle down a little bit. Um, sometimes they can still be quite noisy. But the thing to think about is that if you're going to disturb fly foxes when they're roosting, they're just going to get more noisy. You might get them to fly off, but they're likely going to fly back. And you're probably going to pass some problems to your neighbor. Um, a couple of years ago, we, we looked at documented attempts by councils up and down the coast um, trying to do um, fly fox dispersals where at four o'clock in the morning, they're, they're banging drums and causing all sorts of noise. You really don't want to be next to that kind of activity that goes for up to a month. Um, and sometimes they do drive the fly foxes away. When we reviewing all of those attempts, we found that in most cases, fly foxes come back. And we also found that in a lot of cases, fly foxes formed camps in new areas that were also next to people. So really, disturbing fly foxes is really just an amplifying issue. Um, it's important to think about or talk about the smells and, and, the, and the droppings. Again, fly foxes, they, they, they do smell, particularly uh, the males. Um, but the interesting thing is that the, the male smell that you smell when you, when you walk around the camp, it's actually similar to how it was. The droppings, you know, people often say, you know, I've touched it, you know, I've actually touched um, the fly fox poop, will I get the civilized given to us? No. Um, is it disgusting? Yes, but we get diseases from it. Not this virus and not Hendra virus, but it's important to think, you know, just like any other animal poo, yeah, there, are, there are some health risks, you know, it's not ideal to be touching animal poo, but it's it's really no different to touching, you know, chicken poo, dog poo, or any other animal poo. It's mainly going to be probably a gastrointestinal disease. So, you know, don't, don't touch poo, I think. It's, it's an easy lesson, most people don't want to do it anyway. Fly foxes feeding in people's gardens. Um, you know, it's, it's probably more an issue for you if you're running a commercial orchard, but from time to time, you get complaints about people that have fly foxes come into their, their garden, and, and for some people, they, they get annoyed in the position of their garden's fruit and they want the fly foxes taking them. Or other people that just get the fly foxes and don't want them around. Um, so the fly foxes, they, they feed at night, and they might come into the backyard and feed on some of the fruits and flowers. Um, if you do want to protect the trees, if, if you, you can use um, a netting, very important to use you know, the right type of netting. Um, in this photo, you can see um, a fly fox entangled in the netting, and that's a very tragic situation. And that fly fox had a, a happy ending because uh, a lot of them where we get to it in time, um, but not all of them are that lucky. And they can get horrendous injuries, and so it's very important that you can use netting to, to cover your tree. If you use the netting, you can't put your finger through. That's the general. Uh, that's the general um, the reason for that is because if you can't poke your finger through, the fly foxes are probably not going to seek their digits into it and get tangled up. And so, you know, if you go through um, the gardening shops, what you'll find is that there's no there's no major price difference between a large aperture netting and small aperture netting. So it makes sense just to get the ones that are going to be wildlife safe. And also, you're not just protecting fly foxes, you're protecting birds, possums, you're stopping snakes from getting caught in, in your nets. That, uh, preventing that from happening is a good thing for your kids and your dogs. Um, and obviously, you know, keep the netting taut or loose and check it quickly if you're around as it might be entangled. And finally, I just want to finish on a note about ecosystem services um, that fly foxes provide. Um, you know, we're, we're here in a, a council building. If you're a local resident, you, you pay rates to the council uh, and they provide some services. Well, fly foxes are, are, are kind of similar, except that you don't pay them rates, but they do provide services for you. The, the eucalypt trees that, that we have and, and other plants that, that we have that are native to Australia, 
they would all be inbred if it weren't for fly fox. They fly huge distances like we saw in the map before. And as they feed on the flowers, they get the pollen stuff on them and they take it to the next tree. Their seed dispersal, if they're, if they're eating a, a fruit and can fly 50 kilometers, they're taking that seed and moving it 50 kilometers away. As Dominic mentioned, you know, they, you, you know, you, you do a restoration project, you don't actually have to plant every single plant that they could possibly eat it because they'll bring it in themselves. And that's their ecosystem services at work. Another thing that's quite interesting is when people look at fly fox camps, they go, the fly foxes are killing their vegetation. They've, they've taken all the leaves off the trees, and that's quite annoying. That's making it look a little bit ugly. Well, yeah, it does look ugly when you just have a small reserve of fly foxes in it, and especially fly foxes in that same spot year to year. But when you think about it from a forest context, that's actually part of what fly foxes do, and that's actually having a benefit uh, biodiversity. In a large forest where you have a, a, a very thick canopy, there isn't much, much chance for the understory species or the species of plants that are found on the ground to, to break through until fly foxes are mm -hmm. they, 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 they roost in the trees, they squabble, they move around, they knock leaves off the tree, and they'll actually open up the canopy. And in some of those thick forests, particularly in the rainforest, what that does is it allows the sun to reach the ground. And, and in doing that, the, the seed bank on the ground is actually able to germinate. And without fly foxes, that just wouldn't happen. And if that doesn't happen for a long time, the seed bank get, gets denuded and you just don't have those, those seeds just not viable. So when you look at a fly fox camp and you look at how they've affected the trees, instead of looking at it and going, man, fly fox is destructive, just think that's actually part of their ecosystem services. Uh, and it, it, it's us that's fragmented the habitat. Of course, fly foxes have to use the same spot all the time. Um, so living with fly foxes to cap off, it's not easy. If you're living right next to a camp, it can be noisy, it can be smelly, um, but they are important animals, and there are some things you can do to, to, to live next to them a little bit easier. Now, I think they're beautiful animals, and they deserve more respect. 